IND Hemp Oil Seeds and Fiber presents The Goodness of Hemp Industrial Hemp Show, where we will pull back the curtain and take you right into the action at the heart of the hemp industry as we follow along with our team and the others in the industry working hard every day to build and develop an all-American supply chain for industrial hemp grain and fiber products. Thanks for tuning in to the Goodness of Hemp Industrial Hemp Show. I'm Greg Necco, your host. Today we've got a great, exciting day for you. We've got a number of our growers, we've got the Department of Ag, and a number of our friends in town. We're gonna head on out, check out some of our fiber field trials, and then take everybody through and take a look at our hemp fiber processing facility. You're not gonna to wanna to miss this, so jump in and let's go. This thing started, I don't know, it's five or six or four or seven years ago. I don't know what it's been. It's been a long road. Um, but we don't give up and we just keep doubling down and you'll see some of the things we did last year and the number of farmers we had last year and, and COVID was hard. So I appreciate what our farmers did and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what the things, some of the things we've done at the oil feed, the oil seed plant. Um, we did some updates this uh, year. Um, because of COVID, gave us the opportunity to do some engineering things and plant uh, things we're looking at right now. Last year was all about grain. Then we were able to squeeze in some of the, the fiber component of it. This year it's about grain and fiber and then just sole purpose uh, fiber. And then uh, we're working really hard right now. There's a big push to try to get some uh, carbon credits for farmers. If you're going to be raising uh, crops and people want to remove the uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, it's global warming things, guys. Uh, so next up, uh, the Department of Ag is going to talk. Uh, Andy Gray, who leads the hemp program for Montana, is going to give us a little update and introduction to his program. I run the hemp program for the Montana Department of Agriculture. Kayla Moore is my right-hand man. She does most of the heavy lifting. and uh, <laughs> But we have a we have a good, like, I mean, thanks, Ken, and everybody for the compliments on how Montana uh, runs their hemp program and, and tries to do it. If you're growing certified seed, primarily for grain, then uh, we may not inspect and sample all of those varieties. So, but that's our decision that we're going to, you know, randomly choose who we inspect and who we, not, who we don't. It's not up to the grower to just say, well, they don't need to inspect me, I'll just go ahead and harvest. In the grand scheme of things, we're just so young, and you guys know how important genetics are and varieties are. You know, there's still uh, corn, soy, wheat, right? There's companies that make millions of dollars on, on just breeding. And so for our industry, it's really important for us, um, our business, and then as a whole, to really identify which varieties work for the specific regions, um, for the harvest and what we're trying to go after. Um, and that just takes years in the making, and it's really important, and, and hopefully you can appreciate the, the resources and time and energy that IND Hemp is putting into this. Um, you know, Genma and Yuma came across from China in a, in a container, a 40-foot container, and don't even want to tell you how much that costs. And, and, and uh, SIH Williams is, is something we're so excited about because um, we, we see a lot of opportunity with having our own genetics and be able to control the, the costing. Um, these trials are going to be important not only for, for yields, but how do we combat the, the region when we have dry years versus not. And then the dual crop model that is it makes a lot of um, competitive advantages for our company, being able to harvest both the grain and then have that residual crop or that straw at the end of the, of the harvest. Um, it's just a big deal for us and a big deal for you guys. And so how do we optimize that? So, um, you know, we're, we're looking at other genetics. We talk about X59 because of um, both the region, we think it grows well here. It's been, uh, you know, the architecture of the grain head has done well. It also has a great flavor profile. We've seen um, good results on the processing end of things. And quite honestly, we worked really hard to get the, the price point where it's at, and we've been working directly with the breeding company up in Canada to make that happen. Overall, this is a, actually a phenomenal stand. Um, 
we're going to watch to see how this high seating rate, like I'd mentioned on our left on H1 and on Yuma, we're looking at higher and lower seating rates. We're going to see how much those higher seated rates will burn through moisture and burn through nutrition. Um, we, we, we have seen Jinma last year reach heights of 12 feet tall dry land in probably not Shoto County, but one county over. Uh, we expect to see that as well this season on uh, on a few fields. Um, if we get the rain, it's tied. It is going to be tied to, to moisture, and some of those sub subby or lowlands will uh, reach those heights we expect. You know that plant that we're growing in Fort Benton is all about this crop here. It's all about fiber. Uh, we 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 are continuing to focus on grain and 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 improve, like Morgan and said, testing and uh, both agronomics, seeding rate, nutrition, planting date, as well as germplasm varieties. What fits Montana? X59 has proven itself pretty good. There's some, uh, but we're not okay with just being pretty good. We want to have the best variety that fits dry land uh, country. In fact, we may end up, uh, we may end up sourcing seed from multiple different suppliers, uh, depending on that environment, whether we're northeastern Montana, whether we're uh, north central Montana, southern. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a few different things. Uh, but part of this is how do we continue to learn with you guys and provide this, the tools that we need in our facility to handle whatever comes our way. And so color sorters are really great um, and super technical piece of equipment. There's like a million lenses in there and they're taking pictures all the time and they, they do a little blast of air. So when you see something that doesn't look like the rest, right? Like one of these doesn't go with the other kind of thing, it blows a little blast of air and kicks it out. Um, and so that was over a quarter million dollar investment in those two pieces of equipment so that you guys could have a little more leniency on your end and we didn't have to reject any loads. And um, so it's a big deal. We're proud of that. Um, Patrick spent a lot of time you know, going through which color sorters to pick, um, how to install them, what's the best effort for that. And so that took some time as well. Essentially the, more, the main constituents that are coming off of that is a, a protein powder that we classify into two different um, concentrations of protein. Hemp hearts, so essentially we're removing that shell of the product or off the seed, and then uh, our hemp seed oil, which uh, that protein has been extracted from, the oil's been extracted from that protein product. And, and, um, we have this really great ultra pure oil that we run through a um, three-step filtration process, and it's just a wonderful product. Um, what's not shown on here is uh, hemp holes, so that shell that's removed off the hearts is also um, a great nutritious product, high in fiber as well. It has the highest level of uh, protein of any seed out there. Uh, it's comparable maybe to flaxseed or linseed, but it doesn't have as good of a fat composition as, well it has a much, flaxseed does not have as good of a fat composition as hemp seed does. Um, so that's where it really, you know, comes in as the advantage is an all-encompassing package, which we'll get into that. You know, horses, just like us, can be sensitive to soy in regards to the phytoestrogens, the allergen aspects of it. Um, no allergies uh, associated with hemp. Uh, you don't have to treat hemp when you're going to feed it to the horses, the hemp seed byproducts, right? You, you have to put soy through a treatment process, an additional toll process, even before it can be fed. Um, you don't have to do that. Here, again, great sources of uh, minerals, you know, high in vitamin E and those gamma linoleic and stereodonic and alpha linoleic or linoleic, whatever. I, I told you, I always mess those up. But, you know, in terms of, you know, coat health and joint health for equines or other animals, it's incredible for that. You know, I'd say using this as a top coat dressing could really boost, um, you know, that, that overall appearance of the animal and health as well. That, that's where, the beginning meets the end, right? That's how we get from the farm to the consumer, is we've got to process some stuff. And that's where the real investment has to happen. And, and that's what IND Hip is doing right now on both sides of the equation, the oil seeds and the fiber side. And on the, uh, on the customer side, we actually have a few different places where we can touch the customer. So first, first touch processing, so that might be crushing the grain into oil or decorticating the fiber into, or the straw into fiber in bass. Um, but then that's, that's a raw material. And then there's potential to upgrade that raw material by refining it. Maybe you heard Ben talk earlier about cottonization. That's taking 
a long-ish, you know, dark fiber and making it look like cotton fiber. That would be refining it and improving it. Or um, taking the meal from the seed pressing and, and pressing it into pellets for feed for horses. And, um, and so we can sell product at different stages and the last stage is being convert. We're going to take that product and convert it into something else. So we'll take that fiber and we'll make a bat of insulation. You know, or make a, a shirt out of it, or a car part, things like that. So there's several different places, you know, in the supply chain where somebody can actually buy a product from us. Um, and what's really unique about IND Hemp is that we, we really kind of own, it, you know, not, not technically legally own, but we, we we have ownership of all levels of the supply chain, right? I mean, X59 is a seed genetics that uh, the Elliots had great foresight to acquire rights to in the, most of the United States. So we have a stable genetics at the lowest price possible. Uh, they acquired, you saw earlier, IH Williams. Um, so it starts at the most fundamental level, the genetic level, because getting seeds is actually really challenging. It's really expensive. You want to go and buy fiber seed from uh, from Europe. You pay seven dollars a pound, plant it at fifty pounds an acre. It starts looking really challenging to build an entire value chain above that. So it's really you know critical for the organization that we touch all these points because over here where the customer buys. That's what's got to happen, right? And all these things got to work from the bottom to the top. And it's our goal as an organization to line them up, figure them out, and, uh, and make it happen. But we can't do that without, you know, the farmers growing the stuff. The economics got to work there, too. Go ahead. Um, so a little bit more about uh, processing and decortication. That's a straw bale on the top. I bet you guys have never seen one. Um, but I'm hoping we're going to see a lot of them coming into the, the plant down the road. We're going to need a lot of them. Building, obviously this is a greenfield site, it was designed specifically for this purpose, 52,000 square feet, and we're going to follow the material flow. So like I said, behind us, uh, you guys over there is where the straw bales will get stored, they'll get brought in through these two doors right here. Um, the way the line works is there's actually two opening lines, so the bales, uh, two bale streams come in and, and bust the bales open, go through some processes, and then they become one, and I'll, we'll show you that all in a minute. We start by breaking the bales open, and then we go to the destoners. The destoners just take out those big, heavy uh, rocks and whatnot. So now we'll go to the other side. All right, so we talked earlier about the decortication process. The decortication process takes that straw in, and it separates the fiber from the inner woody core, right? So we busted the bales up, we pulled the heavy rocks and stuff out of them, and then we're going to blow them over here to these two big hoppers. These two machines are basically meters, you know, they're surge tanks. And so we fill them up with the straw. We can dial the meters up and down to how fast we want to go. We control the speed of the line from these two machines right here. And the process of pulling that herd away from that fiber really starts here. What happens pretty much every step of the way is the herd is falling out by gravity. So like I said, we're kind of sucking that air and we're blowing the air from, you know, with the fiber from one machine to another. And then the herd is falling out onto big conveyor belts and all the herd travels along this line over here. So um, we'll, we'll kind of walk through here. We'll, it'll get a little single file, but let's, let's take a look. bit of a hodgepodge of equipment in here um, that's come from different parts of the world and different manufacturers but that white stuff over there that you see that is the primary decortication process so you know as we work from one end of the line to the other that fiber is getting cleaner each step of the way more of that herd is falling out to that big conveyor belt on the bottom and then when the fiber gets all the way through this line the fiber is basically done and it goes down over to the packaging area over there uh, when the herd comes through, it actually goes to these machines right there. But like I said, everything gets pneumatically conveyed. So each of these machines, you see these, these uh, ports on the top, that's where fiber is being dumped in. It's being sucked from one machine to the next machine, pneumatically conveyed. And because of that, we have to have another giant air filtration system. So this air filtration system over here is maybe a fifth of the way complete. It's going to be just as long as the other one in the other room and two of them wide. And then on the wall is actually the, the uh, waste collection system. So, you know, those giant, that, that's 60,000 CFM, so 105,000 CFM just to basically manage this equipment over here and, and move that, that material around. 
The herd gets sucked up and gets distributed to these two machines up here at the, up top. These this is our herd cleaning system over here. So like I said, that whole time we were pulling the, the herd out of the fiber. But now the herd's got a little bit of fiber in it. And so the machines up top are built to take that fiber out of the herd. And then the herd comes out and then it goes through, there'll be another shaker over there underneath the other one. And then we'll, then we'll run the herd over a sieve and we'll take out all of that dust and small particulates. And now we have true clean herd. We took out the fiber and we took out the fines and the herd is done. At that point, we've got chips that are half an inch long or so, and they, they're, they resemble wood chips, just thinner and longer, more like a, uh, if you took straw and, and a wood chip and you, you know, turned them together, made them one thing, it's, that's kind of what this is gonna look like. So from there, the herd is done. It'll get sucked off of the, the sieves with, with air again. And then we have two choices of where the herd can go. We can send it all the way to the end down there to our packaging line, or we can send it to this room over here, which is our mill room. So we still haven't gotten all the equipment assembled for the mill room, but basically there's going to be two large hoppers in there that are as tall as the room is, and they feed a hammer mill. So, you know, the first hopper feeds a hammer mill, and we can reduce the size of that herd. We can turn it into a particular powder, and that can be used in anything from like making cat litter or spill kits for oil absorbent um, or powders for fillers and plastics. And so there's a two-stage process. We mill, we sort, take the overs, and we mill and sort. And then we've got two or three product streams of small particulate herd that can be made. That's a value-added process. More energy, more time, more labor, more electricity, more value. More technical sales um, to get into the composites. You're looking at longer sales cycles. It, it could take two years to get somebody to really you know, go through that engineering work to use that material. Giant opportunity in the long run, a lot of work in the front end in the science to, uh, to get it adopted. However, the other alternative is, instead of taking that herd that just got cleaned and putting it into the mill room and reducing its size, is we send it all the way down here to the end to the packaging. So this is a compressed film packaging line. There's actually two baggers over here, yes, fed by more, one bin. So successful. if you see that blue rotary valve up top, that blue cyclone right there goes on top of that bin, and it sucks that, fire, or that herd from those herd cleaners, drops it into that bin. That bin has a live bottom floor going two different directions. One direction feeds the uh, bagger on that side, which is the tower over there, and the other direction feeds the bagger on this side, which is this tower right here. These are form fill seal machines, which means we bring in a spool, a roll of plastic. That roll of plastic will already be printed with artwork for the finished product. You slide that roll of plastic in there and it actually makes the bag as it goes. So these big chambers get full of the herd, it smashes them down with a bunch of hydraulic pressure and then builds the bag, fills the bag, seals the bag, and then it's off on the conveyor belts to get put onto pallets. It's imperative that we add compression factor to the herd because it's really lightweight and shipping things out of here is going to be really expensive. So we've got to get as close to a 40,000 pound truckload as possible. So that's why we have these really expensive baggers to compress it. Then also, we're going to make five tons an hour of material. That's a lot of material. And so we've got to have automated systems to handle that material.